don't know if you've heard about the, there's a story uh, between Crowley and John Watkins. Anyone heard the story, this interaction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go on, okay. tell, it, tell, well, it. tell it. Yeah, people have to, have to hear the story. So it's, it's quite amazing. So John Watkins founded the, the Watkins books in 1893. And uh, this bookshop has been here since 1901. And Crowley used to visit it quite a lot. And at one point he decided to play a sort of prank, I guess, on, on John. And... Uh, he basically conjured some sort of spell that made, uh, I don't know if it was all the books or some of the books in part of the shop disappear, but basically books disappeared. Uh, Watkins was shocked, and, uh, and then Crowley conjured another spell back and canceled it, and the books were back. So that's, that's the story. Uh, supposedly at that point in his life, John Watkins did not have the best eyesight, um, <laughs> so it's possible that Crowley, may have been, being the trickster that he, that he is, may have taken advantage of that. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a story. I think it's mentioned in Simmons' uh, uh, The Beast. Yeah, uh, um, and, yeah, so anyways, there's a lot, of, a lot of history between Watkins and Crowley. And, uh, what, and I want to say what a delight is to see all, all of you here. Such demand. Uh, so many people want to hear Stephen speak. And it's an honor uh, and a privilege to have you here. Um, First, does everyone know what happened in 1875 on this day? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, because... That's why we're here today. <laughs> he was born. That's right. That's right. Very good. Yes. Very good. That's happy, happy birthday to Uncle Al. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, so yeah, so amazing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very fortuitous that yeah, we get to publish the book and this week and, and have a, a talk today. And uh, and you're in for a treat. I mean, I, um, I'm very proud of this book and of Stephen's introduction. He really gives you a lot of great history. Uh, about Crowley, and what what better person to speak about Crowley? Stephen truly, you know, understands him inside out. Um, Stephen's a an amazing scholar. You are uh, a great I'll, author. I'll go with that. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, he's a publisher as well. How many books have you published? Uh, Forty or fifty. I don't know. Maybe more. Can't keep count anymore. So quite quite a lot of amazing books. We. We stock a lot of them here. Very proud to do so. Yeah, I was uh, pleased to see them on the shelf down here. Yeah. They're great. They're great. Uh, and he's given talks before in the shop as well. Yeah. Some of his books. Uh, uh, and uh, and we've even had one publishing uh, uh, collaboration before, where he wrote an introduction to. Uh, uh, actually, oh wait a second. Actually, two, two. two. Yeah, you because, forgot that. Yeah. No, no. I remember now. Yeah. So two. So Splendor Solace, a great medieval manuscript that we. We, uh, we brought back in, in a really cool edition to print, and he's got an intro here. And it's a, a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, so uh, it's worth yes, it. Would, it would probably be the most beautiful alchemical manuscript ever painted. It is. It is. It is amazing. Um, so this this is very cool. We've got that, and I don't know where if we have a copy. Maybe some people will see. We also have our own version of the Voynich manuscript, which is the world's most mysterious manuscript. Uh, and Stephen wrote. Uh, also, I wrote really an introduction to that. Sadly, it's never been translated, so that would have been much nicer to have had the translation. Oh, nice still. Nice to <laughs> <laughs> You want me to work really hard. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Well, you know, I mean, a few years ago, there was, you know, people thought that the Voyage Transcript was a hoax. Yeah. Uh, and now we know that it wasn't. We're, we're, we're certain Yeah, that. they applied science to it and figured out the exact dating of the manuscript and the, the ink. And it really is a lot older than even John Dee. Dates back to, I can't remember. Yeah, I need yeah. to look up the book. 30 sure. or something, I think. Um, so so that, that, was, that was fun to do with Watkins, because Watkins are fun to work with and uh, appreciate the stuff I do, which is nice. And I have to say, the first time I was in Watkins was probably 1972. And like Crowley, I have been in and out uh, over many years since then. But I didn't do any magic down here. <laughs> I don't think it would have been popular if I'd made you a stock. <laughs> no, no. Um, okay, okay, so before you take over, I first want to say thank you all for coming here and supporting Stephen. Let's give him a round of applause for being here today. So yeah, he's going to give uh, uh, a bit of a talk, and then we're going to open up to, to questions. So uh, yeah, it should be interactive. So enjoy. The floor is yours. Okay. So first of all, please forgive me if I sit down, because I'm going to have to sit down. Yeah. And uh, if you can't hear me, please wave furiously, and I'll turn the volume up. 
don't have a microphone, but uh, I can adjust that. So, talking about Uncle Al, uh, on, on Facebook once I made a remark about Uncle Al. Everybody knows that that's Alistair Crowley. Some pompous person cut in and said, He's not your uncle. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. But anyway, uh, yeah, Facebook has brought an awful lot of material to the fore. Uh, stuff that was previously hidden away uh, comes through Facebook and, and through publishing. And I'm particularly pleased that uh, many, many grimoires have now been published, some by me, some by David here, um, over, over the years, such that when I first started uh, being interested in magic in the early 60s, or maybe even earlier than that, uh, there were very few books you could have um, the, the Golden Dawn, the four volumes, or you could have Key of Solomon and uh, uh, Crowley's Goetia. So, as a school kid, I decided I wanted to see Crowley's Goetia, and I, it was pre-15, so I can't remember exactly how old I was. And I went into the Theosophical Society bookshop and asked them for the Goetia, and they, no, 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 we don't stock things like that. I said, well, can you get it in? Can you buy it in for me? And uh, they said, yes, we would, and we'll send you a card when we've got it. So in due course, I got a card which said they had it in stock. So I went in, and the, the woman, and she was a woman, not a girl, at the desk, looked at me, looked at my card, looked shocked, and ran into the back room uh, mm -hmm. to find the manager of the bookshop, who was Cecile Novi. Uh, we can't sell this, I could hear. We can't sell this to him. He's only a schoolboy. Mm. And uh, Cecile came out and said, no, 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 I know him. It's all right. You can sell it to him. <laughs> so that was my first copy of the Goetia um, in the Theosophical Bookshop in Sydney, as it happens. Okay, now let's talk about Alistair Crowley, about Crowley, before I start to criticize him. <laughs> so here I go. First of all, he was a mountaineer. He was a hell of a mountain climber. He may not have been very kind to the people he climbed with, but he still holds a number of records. Um, he was the fastest climber to go up one of the Mexican mountains. I don't remember what it's called. He spent 65 days on the Valtoro Glacier, which is still a world record. I mean, why would anybody want to camp on a glacier for 65 days? And I wondered as well, so I, I, I couldn't ask him, but I figured out by doing a bit of reading that he'd taken um, the Kabbalah Unveiled, which was a translation by Mathis, which some of you may know. It would have to be one of the most dense, I won't say boring, but I might have said it, um, books that you've ever seen. And Crowley read it right the way through on the Baltoro Glacier, and that's the only reason anybody could have for sitting on a sheet of ice for 65 days. Anyway, he still has a couple of records um, climbs in uh, K2, which is Kankanjenga. Um, probably they, at one stage you had the world altitude record, I think it was 24,000 feet, and then some climbers made it to 27,000 feet, so he lost the record. But anyway, he was definitely a good mountaineer. Uh, he practiced on Beachy Head, which is, if anybody's been there, you'll know it's very crumbly limestone and very difficult to climb up. So that's number one. Number two, he was a poet. Um, we can agree or disagree on the quality of his poetry, but some of it was good enough to make the, the Oxford um, classical book of mystical verse. And some of the other poems, I think, are quite good. He got a bit, a bit trite at times, but some of his um, Swinburne-esque poems are pretty good. Number three, he introduced yoga to the, to the West. Now, anybody who knows about the history of yoga will go, no, 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 he didn't, no, he didn't. But he did, he made it popular, and he wrote uh, the first really logical book on yoga, which is the first part of this book here. And you've got to hand it to him for that, because in those days you couldn't just um, catch a flight down to India and find a yogi to teach you yoga. He, he actually caught a boat, went to Sri Lanka, Ceylon as it was then, got hold of the Attorney General, I mean, why start at the bottom, and got that guy to teach him yoga. He was also um, a reasonable yogi in his own right. 
Uh, and so they sat around the lake at Kandy, which is right up in the mountains in Sri, Sri Lanka, and did yoga. And um, I've also been up there and sat there, and it's an incredibly peaceful and nice place. Um, the, the locals are, are quite, quite brilliant as well. And you see queues of people dressed entirely in white going to this temple or that temple. And it's, it's fun to be there. Anyway, so that's where he learned yoga, and that made the, the first book in this book four. Now, when he wrote it, he wasn't intending to do, um, well, he was intending to do four books, because he called it book four, but he hadn't any idea what the other parts would be. And he called it, um, I think he called it, uh, was it mysticism? Instead of calling it yoga, uh, it would have been more sensible to call it yoga. And he made real progress with yoga. Um, I'm going to criticize some of his progress in magic, but in yoga, he definitely done, uh, he'd earned his stripes. What else? Ah, chess master. Um, he could quite easily do chess blindfold and do multiple board chess, which is better than I can do. And when asked, are you a chess master, he would say, no, I'm a talented amateur. So for once, he was modest about what he was capable of. <coughs> That was a rare phenomenon with Crowley, who was definitely not modest about anything. Um, and then the fifth one is that he introduced mescaline and hashish to the West. Now, my wife said that's not a positive. <laughs> well, I think it was a positive because um, that was the sort of beginning of the hippie thing in the 60s. People read Crowley in the 60s. I read Crowley in the 60s. I read Crowley before the 60s. Um, and it opened everything up. Uh, I think that the, the hippie generation is a significant piece of, of history, recent history. Um, the Beatles liked him so much that they put his photograph on the front cover of Sgt. Pepper's uh, Lonely Hearts Club Band, which for anyone who lived through the 60s, <coughs> you will know it. If you haven't, then maybe you've never heard of it, but it was a very famous um, record at the time. And so Crowley was one of those people they liked. And then number six, and this is the killer, in 2002, a BBC poll placed Crowley on, at the 73rd position on a list of the 100 greatest Britons of all time. And they had, I think, 300,000 votes for that. So that's a pretty representative thing. He was actually a few places ahead of Winston Churchill, I believe. Which, yeah, that raised my eyebrow as well. So there we are. I've done my six good things about Crowley. Now I can start to get out of the way. Yeah, I have, I have, I, I really loved Crowley's writings when I was young because mostly I didn't understand them. <laughs> now I understand them. I'm not so keen on them, but we'll get there. So how did I get involved with working on Crowley and so forth? Well, I edited a few books. Um, this is long before the OTO decided they owned Crowley. I edited Crowley's Tunisia Diaries in uh, 1923. This is after he was kicked out of Italy um, by no less than Mussolini. And he migrated across the Mediterranean and proceeded to do a lot of stuff, walking out into deserts and so forth, which we'll come to later. I then edited his astrology book, which he did with Evangeline Adams, um, which is not one of his great works. <coughs> and I edited his uh, Dao De Jing, which is a classic of um, uh, Taoist thinking. And he claimed to have translated it, but I know that Crowley didn't read Chinese at all, and I can prove that. Um, what he did was he took Legg's translation and put in the key words he thought should have gone in there that Legg had already forgotten, you know, mostly um, Western magical things, which I'm sure the author of the Dao De Jing never, ever thought of. Dao De Jing I was quite fond of when I was uh, a kid. It still has some messages. And then I got down to doing serious work, so the Thoth Tarot Pack, which you all must be familiar with because it's probably the second most popular tarot pack in the world. Um, Etting can confirm that otherwise. Um, there was a, a black and white edition first, and then there was a rather poor color one. 
And then Donald Weiser asked me to arrange the photography uh, of the pack, which was then kept in the Warburg Institute. And that was a twofold job. First of all, find a photographer who would do excellent shots because the Warburg said to me very pompously, this is the only chance you get. After you, nobody photographs the pack. In fact, somebody did later, but anyway, so I got Norbert Gallia, who was a good photographer, and we went in there. And the other half of the job was persuading the Warburg to let us do it. And he set up his camera, and these cards are not card size. They're big, and we propped them up on an easel and shot them uh, several times over and so forth. It took us an entire day to film off to, to Don, and he arranged, the, I think, the 1977 publication of the Thoth Terror Pack. So I didn't get credit, but I didn't need one. Uh, Norbert didn't get one either. Um, then I looked at uh, Crowley 777, which, um, as you know, is a, a collection of tables um, stacked against the Tree of Life, uh, comparing religions and scents and perfumes and um, methods of magic and uh, food, not food, um, all sorts of other things. And I thought that could be improved. So initially I thought I'd just add a few extra columns and so forth. And after a while I saw, no, I can go a little bit mad. And so over the course of five editions, I produced uh, 840 tables. Crowley, I think, only had 200 tables. I expanded it and produced it as complete magicians. Yeah, complete magicians tables. And that that I enjoyed doing. Um, and then, uh, well, that was that was about it. I've done a few other things connected with Crowley, but let me go back to my childhood. So, as a as a as a school kid, as well as buying the um, the Goetia, I bought a 1929 subscriber's edition of Magic and Theory and Practice. I think they've probably got a reasonably high second-hand price now, but I bought mine for, I think, 12 shillings or something. Very reasonable. Pocket money. Indeed, it was my pocket money. And I thought, this looks like the text, so I'll try to read it. And I found it very heavy going. And I would challenge anybody in this room to say that it wasn't heavy going the first time they read it. Because Crowley, to read Crowley, you need to have read all of Crowley to be able to understand one of his books because he cross-references himself all the time. John Simon said of, of Magic and Theory and Practice that it was a city within a city and Crowley didn't provide the key. So um, Simons wrote his first biography. So in here, the third volume, is um, Magic and Theory and Practice. Uh, so I enjoyed footnoting it. I probably should have done more footnotes, but uh, time was restricted. OK, so now, people. OK, so as you probably all know, Gerald York um, acted to preserve most of Crowley's manuscripts. Uh, what he did was he actually paid Crowley uh, for writing, he paid him for his time, and then he started to actually, Crowley was short of money, York would say, oh, can I, I'll buy this manuscript from him. So he effectively bought a lot of stuff that Crowley might have left in attics or thrown out or otherwise uh, not used. And so he built up the largest collection of Crowleyana uh, ever. Uh, now, York was a fascinating guy. He was uh, 14th in line to the, the British crown uh, because he was from the Yorkist side of the, um, of the families that made up the uh, British crown. And um, he owned a place uh, down in Gloucestershire. When I say a place, I think it was somebody said 30,000 acres, but I find that hard to believe, called Forthampton Court. And so he invited me down there on a number of occasions. I went down and then he had all these stuck in folders and loose and in cupboards and so forth. And he lent me these. So the two that I published, they were lent to me by Gerald York. And he was, he was very trusting. Yeah, take it, bring it back when you're finished. And it might have been the only copy, so I was quite, um, quite pleased by that. 
And then he had a place in London, um, and so I got invited to dinner there. <coughs> and I heard stories about Crowley from him. Um, he referred to him as Old Crow, because apparently Crowley's correct pronunciation is Crowley. And I'm aware, crucially aware, that I'm saying Crowley because that's how I remember from my childhood. I thought it must be Crowley, everybody said Crowley. But in fact, it's Crowley. So uh, I made a little note here, start by saying Crowley and stick with it, but I can't. <laughs> so um, York was also connected with writers who published a lot of um, occult stuff in those days. And so one of the, the, the dinners, <coughs> his first question over dinner was, um, how do you translate a thame, uh, you know, the witchcraft thing, a uh, knife? And so we discussed it for a while, and some unfortunate author had written about witchcraft at some considerable, I'm not saying who it was, considerable length, and um, had mistranslated a thame or screwed it up. He's, he's passed on now, so there's no harm in saying that. But those are the sort of conversations that we had um, during dinner. The second, oh, the other thing is that York um, invited various people down to Fourth Hampton, and what he loved to show them was the the stocks, you know, with the criminals who put their head and their hands through and clamp down, and the whipping post, because he'd seen when he um, came in charge of the Fourth Hampton estates that they were almost derelict. So he had the local carpenter rebuild the stocks. So when Jimmy Page came down to Forthampton with some of his gang, uh, who were misbehaving a little bit, he threatened them. I will have you put in the stocks. And he did have the legal right to do that because he was still the lord of the, or the laird or the lord of uh, Forthampton and the estates around. So he never actually did it, I did ask. But, um, he uh, enjoys, enjoyed talking about it. And I asked him, where does his family come from, and so forth, being unaware that York meant Yorkist. And he pulled out some of his genealogical um, uh, charts written on parchment, and then I couldn't tell, but now I could tell that they, they must have easily been 15th century. Um, so he still had all the stuff, and it was kept in a large steel-bound chest, which locked up, and it was just full of manuscripts and things. And I guess that's when you belong to that sort of family, that's how you keep it. So enough about York, but um, York preserved Crowley's works. If he hadn't done it, they would have probably, to a large extent, got lost. Uh, stuff is being published, but there's still stuff that's not published, but never mind about that. So talking about Jimmy Page, um, Jimmy, was really into Crowley. He bought in 1972 Baleskin, um, which was Crowley's uh, house on the shores of Loch Ness. And uh, he, he later sold it. And very sad things have happened to Baleskin. It got burnt down twice. And there are people now attempting to restore it. But frankly, I think its heart is gone. Um, you burn a house twice, there's not much left. Um, but Jimmy also opened a bookshop in London called the Equinox. And we sat, he had a flat above, um, which was hung with relatively modern Egyptian uh, cloth wall hangings. Um, we decided we were going to publish Crowley and start a publishing company. So I've always liked the idea of a publishing company, as most of you know. And, um, so we planned it out, and it was going to be mostly Crowley books. And this was back in a time when Crowley books were not easily accessible. And um, he gave it to his lawyers, um, Moore, Warren, and Ellis. And I can remember their name because they kept pissing around with the documentation for weeks, for months, and finally for more than a year. Because, and not because there was any argument between Jimmy and me, We'd agreed, we want to publish, he's happy to put the money up, I'm happy to do the editorial work and I know how to arrange printers and all that's easy. But the, the lawyer just wanted to put this, con this, this clause, that clause, the other clause. And so in the end we both went, well look, let's just forget it. So that um, 
publishing company never happened, which was a bit sad. He, of course, published a lot of his own work, um, and he published it in good quality uh, print and paper, which means a lot of it survived, a lot of it uh, became collector's items. And um, his most substantial work was the Equinox, which um, was run for many issues, but the first ten from 1909 to 1913 were his, his pet project, really. But in it, he did a few nasty things, like he published the Golden Dawn's secret rituals in there for all to see, and Mathers attempted to stop it by taking legal action against him, but failed because Crowley had more money. So I, I think that's a rather nasty way of knocking the, the competition off. And um, a nice sort of irony of that is that later, in the um, 80s, Francis King published the OTO's rituals, which upset them. So it was almost um, a reaction. What Crowley did to the, the Golden Dawn, Francis did to the OTO. And I'm not saying approve of that. I definitely disapprove of what uh, Crowley did to the Golden Dawn. Um, Francis King and I wrote a couple of books together, and we were pals. I lived in Chiswick. He lived just down the road, the other side of Hammersmith. And he was a, a fascinating raconteur. He, would, he needed a few glasses of claret to get going, but once he had a few glasses of claret in him, some of the stories, I just wish I'd had a tape recorder and had it on. Um, these are about the people in the magical world in London in those days, but also a lot of other strange things, like the, the abode of love in the West Country, which was a, a sect which you can guess from the name what, uh, what, what their direction was. They, they bought, they, they made enough money, they earned or had contributed enough money to buy a substantial church in South London. And then the abode of love finally fell about, leaving nobody owning the church. Um, and so Francis and I came up with the idea of if we represented ourselves, and he could because he knew all the background, as a carry-on from the abode of love, then maybe we could uh, claim the church. But um, it didn't happen. Uh, so now, what do I think of Crowley's magic? Well, <coughs> I think that when he published the, the Goetia, he said that spirits are parts of the brain and that magic was effectively psychological. I don't believe that for one minute. I firmly believe from many direct experiences that spirits are definitely independent and not part of anybody's brain. And um, so that little essay with the Goetia was a, really an internal conflict because the Goetia talks about spirits as spirits, which was the view right up to the, um, the late 1900s. Oh, and Crowley brought in this idea that it might have been psychological. And he did that because <coughs> he saw that science was moving ahead and the Victorians thought that they'd conquered almost everything with science. So he assumed that psychology was going to uh, explain magic. And he figured by the end of the 20th century, magic would be a subset of psychology. So he got involved, he read Freud, whatever else, and started promoting that idea. But however, when he used a woman as a scryer, and the woman would, um, um, a mistress or a, or a wealth, girlfriend or a wife would produce information which was not in either his head or her head and therefore came from an external source. So he vacillated between magic is all in the head. No, magic depends upon external spirits. And I would say there are some forms of magic in the head which you can do, um, particularly ones which involve you and what you're going to do. So I'm going for a job interview. I can do a piece of magic in my head to make the job interview go a lot better. And the reason is that what I've done in my head has improved my level of confidence and my ability to articulate, and I go in and I get the job. 
<coughs> Paulet is sort of magic with a small m, but the sort of magic that does completely large, unexpected things does not stem from the head. To, to get really magical results, you need the collaboration of a spirit, um, an angel, a demon, a daemon, whatever you like to call them. These are, these are the creatures that can do things that mere humans cannot. And I have, <coughs> in some of my um, talks, uh, described a few of my experiences with that. And, uh, I mean, for example, one related to Alice Bailey, if anybody has not heard it or has heard it, I can tell that story. Does anybody want to hear it again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I was doing, um, I was actually using material from the Equinox, and it was actually uh, an invocation of Tapsasaras, or Tapsasaras, if you like. And one, there were four of us, and one of us was the guy who had control of the university language laboratories. Now, I can say this now, but I wouldn't have said it any time back then. And so we used them, a language laboratory, um, to do the evocation, because then we could record it exactly, everything that happened. Um, and there was plenty of floor space, and he had the key, as it were, and nobody was ever going to interrupt us. I know you shouldn't do these sort of things in the university, but we, we were pushing knowledge forward, so why not? Anyway, um, there were four of us, and we got working on this invocation, and we did, did it exactly by the book. And one of the problems that we discovered just then was the um, air con in these language laboratories is fierce. So you light the incense and straight up through the ceiling it's gone. So I can tell you there was very little incense at this evocation. But um, we were reaching almost to the end and one of these four guys is a joker. And he, um, we were reaching a magical pitch, not a psychological pitch, but a magical pitch. And he just intoned, Alice Bailey. And we went, for fuck's sake, what are you doing? Shut up. And by that time, the whole momentum had been lost. And we went, okay, well, we'll just pack up, and uh, next time you're not coming. Uh, he, he's passed on, so I can say bad things about him. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we, we all went home, and I, I was pissed off, and the other two were as well. And the next morning, the guy in the uh, language laboratory rings up all of us. He started with me. Hey, you never know what happened. This morning, a guy in a station wagon turned up, and the station wagon was completely packed with every edition of Alice Bailey that's ever been printed. <laughs> and he parked in front of the library. The library was next to the sound laboratories. And he wanted to see the librarian, so the librarian reluctantly came out, and this, this guy... I'm just going to call him Crazy Man. Crazy Man said, I want to donate all these books to the library because it's, it's valuable stuff. I'm not saying anything for or against Alice Bailey, but she definitely wrote a lot of stuff, and it was all there in the back of this utility. And the, the librarian said, no, 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 I, I don't think we want that. We're an academic library, and Alice Bailey doesn't really qualify. He went, no, you've got to have it. And so he starts putting it on the pavement box after box after box after box. And he gets in the car and he goes mm, and drives off. <laughs> the librarian's left for the mountain of Alice Bailey. So the moral of the story is that the magic works, but in this case he was short-circuited by this idiot of my friend <laughs> and his, his what he thought was a very funny thing to say because Alice Bailey is not into evocation or into spirits or anything else like that. So, sure, it was funny, but he should have kept it for the pub later. Anyway, so uh, that's just one thing that I think shows that magic, that can't be done in the head. I could sit down for, for a millennium thinking Alice Bailey, and nobody would bring a carload of books and put them at my feet. So I, I was convinced before that, but I was definitely convinced that time interested in Greco-Egyptian 
magic. And Greco-Egyptian magic is a little bit more complicated than what you might find in the equinox. But there's not nearly as many stage um, regulations. as It's not so detailed in how you do it. But I, I have figured out how you do it. And so, what was it, three, four weeks ago, I did one of the Greco-Egyptian rituals. And it was a ritual written by a magician called Astrasukos. Uh, I won't give you the exact reference, but if you find Astrasukos, there's only one of the spells in there is by him. And the translation by Betts said, uh, it's something which brings things to you. So I thought, ah, it's just like, you know, I want stuff, give me money, give me girlfriends, whatever. But I went back and looked at the Greek, um, and the Greek actually said, it brings to you your stuff which is in somebody else's hand. And I thought, that's, that's fascinating. Let's, let's try it out. So we did, and it, it's a relatively fast um, operation. Normally I'd expect a result within a week. It was a slightly more than a week, and I got an email. And as you know, I've been published by a large number of publishers. I really like this one. Um, and it was, I'm not saying which publisher, and he wrote, I'm terribly sorry, but we haven't paid you royalties since 2007 and I would like to square the books. Please give me your bank details because I have £13,504 for you. <laughs> and I went, yes, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately gave him my bank account and in due course the money came. Now, that was something of mine that was in his hand. So it was exactly as the Greek text showed but it wasn't exactly as the English translation showed. So um, I'd like to go back to the originals with grimoires, with everything, if possible. Um, I, uh, when I did my PhD, I said I wanted to do a PhD on the grimoires and the transmission of magic from uh, the ancient world to the modern world. And they checked, do you, speak, do you read Latin? And yes, I did. I did it at school. Not very well, but I hated it at school. I wish I'd been paid it more attention. And they said, well, if you're going to do this, you need to um, learn uh, Korean Greek. And so I put my hand on and said, yes, OK, I'll do that. God, that was a stupid remark, because it's much, much more difficult than Latin. So I had to do it from the time I'd applied for the PhD to the time that the term started, and I did. And it's one of the hardest things I've done in my life. But it's helped, because with the um, Greco-Egyptian stuff, uh, it helps to see what the original intention was. Okay, so, criticism of Alistair Crowley. Number one, he didn't complete his major magical operations. For example, he started Abramelian. He bought Boleskine, the, the house, to do the Abramelian operation. And he arranged an oratory and fine sand upon the veranda and all those things. And he did the first couple of days, maybe it was a week or two, of prayers. And I think he was getting bored. Um, anybody who's done Abramelin will know that that's highly likely. Um, and so his friend uh, Kelly, the artist, said, um, Oh, my uh, his sister? It was his sister. He's got a problem. Will you come and help sort it out? So yeah, Crowley went, Yes, yes, I want to go and do something interesting went down to see her. She had a problem. She'd arranged to be engaged to two guys and they were both about to visit. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? She said. I don't know whether to marry this one or marry that one. Carly came up with the answer. Marry me. <laughs> <laughs> and now that girl, uh, Rose Crowley, was the one that was instrumental and I mean instrumental in the reception of the Book of the Law in 1904, much more than most people give it credit for. So he didn't finish Abramelin. So then years later, uh, while he was traveling through Assam and then down into China, by ponies going down uh, to the bottom of deep canyons and up the other side and down, how can anybody concentrate whilst 
on the edge of a ledge, which is here and drops a long way, uh, he said he finished Abrimelech. That is impossible, because the structure of Abrimelin is you you purify yourself for either six months or 18 months, depending on which translation you've read, and then at the end you call all of the spirits and use the talisman squares to have them there, to bind them, and then to release them. Crowley didn't have the squares with him, he didn't have an oratory, he didn't have anything. He just sat on the back of the pony and um, did whatever he did. But he never finished Abramelin, so he didn't get that. Secondly, these uh, 30 ether calls, um, probably most people in this room have seen them. I was fascinated by them when I first came to London. I met up with uh, Professor Don Laycock and between us we worked out a dictionary of the Enochian language is the Enochian Dictionary, um, published under Don's name, and I was the publisher. And it's still the most complete uh, dictionary of uh, Enochian language. And Enochian was supposed to be the language that the angels used. So the calls which were provided by the angels would call the angelic presences, and this is a big piece of magic. So Crowley started it in Mexico. 30 calls. How many did he do? He did two and then stopped. And it was only a lot <coughs> later when with Victor Newberg, he went to Busada in Algeria, went up to the top of a mountain and continued with the calls, uh, along with a lot, of, um, a lot of drugs and other things. Crowley was not a purist. He thought, as many things you can lay on the, the technique, good. Sex, drugs, whatever. But again, I would say that, you know, what he called was probably not these ethers, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Yeah, it's a lot of true. I'd say we'll go to questions sooner, but this is awesome. Uh, give me a few more minutes. <laughs> okay, so first thing is he never finished. The second thing was he was a show-off. So his introduction to magic and theory and practice was just, I know everything and here I'm going to dash it down quickly and you can bloody well work it out for yourself. So for example, the Tree of Life, which is central to the Kabbalah, which is central to a lot of magic, he put into a footnote the whole description of the Tree of Life. So when I edited it here, I pulled it out of the footnote and put it onto a page by itself, corrected three mistakes, and then added footnotes to what had previously been a footnote. So it's now readable. But you still can't get the whole understanding of the Kabbalah by just one page. And then he put a few paragraphs to give the understanding of the Book of the Law, and again, that's impossible. And then he went off uh, on a things through psychology and philosophy, Western philosophy. He learned most of his Western philosophy from just one book. So he was a show-off. Um, you know, why do that? If you're making a, a basic book on magic, you at least start at the beginning. Uh, maybe you have a second volume or something. But he didn't. He dropped right into the middle of it, or right at the end. And then he took the pentagram and hexagram rituals not content with them, they're quite good rituals in their own right, they do, they do work. He changed them into two new rituals which he called the Star Sapphire and the Star Ruby. And what did he do? Well, he pulled out the Hebrew and he replaced it with Greek. Now, the Hebrew is the name of the archangels. So in the pentagram ritual, if you call the four archangels around you, you're actually clearing the space and protecting yourself. He replaced it with Greek terms, which were not the Greek terms of particular entities, but they were category terms, like the dodoches. Um, you can't sort of have, I'll have all architects here and uh, all painters there and all magicians here. A category isn't something that's going to protect your temple. It has to be an entity. So he actually bowdlerized the pentagram hexagram ritual. He made this hexagram ritual 
politically correct if he'd lived now um, it would have been classed as such because it started off just with the father etc so you put the the mother the child the spirit the other spirit everything in it was and that was his new hexagram ritual i don't think that was good so he wasn't practicing the method of science which would have been to take something and develop it and test it and then his great test oh no, it's not a test. He wanted to, to thrill uh, himself. So he had Victor Newberg there to thrill him, that's one thing. But, and he knew that the technique of ceremonial magic is to create a circle, consecrate it, stand in the middle, maybe call the archangels, and then you place a triangle, which is the place where the spirit or the demon will come. There's a definite separation. You don't invite the demon into the circle. So what did Crowley do? He went and sat in the triangle. And I think he just wanted, I, I want something, an effect, anything, even if I have to risk myself. And there's some argument which says that maybe he did risk his sanity a little bit on that particular calling in Busada. He almost didn't do it. He walked down the mountain with Newberg. And then he had an inspiration and went back up again. Um, there was a sandy place, drew the circle and the triangle, and then went and sat in the triangle, and then called the demon Koronzon into him. Who wants to call a demon into them? Only somebody who wishes to go mad or have a thrill. And in Crowley's case, it was a thrill because he assumed he had enough power to fight it. That's just dumb. I'm sorry, but it is. So, this book here, it was written in very different time spaces. So 1913 was the first one on yoga, uh, published 1913, no, 1912. 1913 was the second one. The second one was supposed to be on magic. What in fact he did was simply list the ceremonial implements that you use for real magic. But he couldn't keep his fingers off them, he had to change them. So the circle had to have a T-square in it and a few other things. His sensor, I think he wanted to trademark his sensor. Um, and he changed the names and so forth. If you've got a system that works, you, you produce the implements and then you do the experiment and you see what happens. But anyway, so that in 1929 he wrote the, the key text, which is Magic and Theory and Practice, which is the third volume in here. And then... Uh, then the fourth volume <coughs> goes back to 1904, which was when he received the Book of the Law. Now, for Crowley, the Book of the Law became a religion. It took him a while. In 1904, he received it, and then it took him, I don't know, five years, nine years, before he even got it out again to read. But he became entranced by it, and he propagated it as um, the religion of Thelema. Now, the philosophy behind it is, is, is good. He said that everybody should do what they're, have, what they're intended to do. He called it their true will. Not do whatever you want, which is how most people interpret Crowley's do what thou wilt shall be the whole war but um, you do what the universe has meant you to do. Maybe the universe meant me to write books, maybe the universe meant me to practice magic, maybe the universe meant me to do something else, but this is the set of rail tracks that I've been in most of my life. So he said, if you do that, then nobody can conflict with you because they should all be doing their true will and the universe should arrange it so that their true will does not clash with your true will. Unfortunately, it's not a practical thing because a lot of people out there doing their untrue will and they will clash with you inevitably. But that was the theory. So the theory was good. Uh, and then he proposed this book of three chapters, which he called the Book of the Law, Liber al Legis. Um, how did he get Liber al Legis? Well, he got it through his wife, Rose. Now, he claims that he sat there and received direct voice and he wrote it down. This is not true. You cannot receive direct voice for hours on end in an empty room. 
And then later, his wife corrected some of the words and made alterations in the text. And why is that? Because she was in the room. And why is that? Because she was acting as a medium. She was hearing it and speaking it, and Alistair was writing it in his Crawley handwriting, a copy of which is in the back of here, because Alistair said, you must always publish my Scrawly writing in there so that nobody can argue about what I actually wrote. <coughs> so on the day, you know, the wife said, we will do the initial invocation this way, and she outlined it. Charlie said, that's rubbish, that's not proper magic. And she said, no, we will do it this way, and they did. And they contacted um, a version of Horus. And Horus then gave them three dates, um, April 18, 19, and 20, during which, between, I think, was it uh, midday and one o'clock, he would dictate a chapter. And that's what happened. So Rose sat behind him to his left, uh, because I, well, I wouldn't say why I checked, how I checked that, to his left, and she spoke and he wrote. And that became Holy Writ. But the Book of the Law, and here if there's any died in the wall Thelemites, I apologize, is like an argument between at least four spirit entities. Because there are instructions which say, this is how you should publish the book, this is how it should be printed. Then there are other instructions which say, uh, effectively cursing the two monotheistic religions. And then there are other ones which are involved with the Egyptian gods. And the gods were the overarching um, god of the, the sky, which was near it, the tiny little male puissant point, which was had it, and then their reconciliation um, in several other names. <coughs> For this book, I found a statue of not Ankh Efen. Konsu, but of Ankh Konsu, who was also a, um, a scribe um, and also lived in the same period and almost certainly looked the same. And so that's published as a photograph. And why do I think that? Name is the same, almost the same, and so forth. So why is that important? Well, it's important because <coughs> Crowley's wife found the grave marker if you like, the commemorative plaque of this particular um, priest. He was a priest of uh, Montu, I think. And that is then used in Salima as the, the main illustration. It's also in here. Uh, I do believe that there was a real transmission happening. I believe that the transmission came from at least four different entities and that it's confused. Um, I don't believe that it's sufficient to create a whole new religion. As Crowley, of course, wished to abolish Christianity by creating a replacement religion, which he said would last for another 2,000 years. Now, at present, I don't know how many OTO members or committed Thelemites there are, but it's going to be in the low thousands. So it's still here, and Crowley would have been happy, but he would have been disappointed that there weren't hundreds of thousands at this point in time. Okay, so now I've admitted all sorts of things, and there's probably some of you in this room thinking, well, I wish you'd shut up. <laughs> so I'm going to stop and uh, open it to questions. Nobody, nobody. Can you say something about Scrabble, like woman, about Babylon? Because it just came to my head that, uh, you know, is it, was yes. it his wife? Was it, uh, mm -hmm. how, how, how was it symbolized, uh, you know, can you just describe it? Uh, um, do you remember? Uh, Babylon, which is spelled B A B A L O N. Yeah. So he uh, hoped that his, each successive girlfriend or wife would be his Babylon. Um, and he practiced sex magic with them. And his early sex magic was not very successful. It um, produced a few bits of money, etc. But later, um, after meeting. Uh, who the hell was it? Uh, the OTO man. Uh, it, it improved. But anyway, so he practiced this throughout his entire life and he personified the partner as Babylon. There's more, but I'm not going to go there. 
anybody else. Great, uh, ritual that's in the book. I mean, obviously he's bastardized a lot of things. You know, but yes, he did. But what, 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 do you, what do you like the most? Well, Grimorium Sanctorum um, was actually bastardized, but it was out of a grimoire. So I, I like it, but it's not usable because it's been messed around. Um, I like the original pentagram and lesser the extent of the hexagram. Uh, I have done the, the um, star sapphire and the star ruby just to see what the effect was. And I don't think they're as powerful as the original. Um, now, his big ritual in there, of course, oh, this is a good question, was the one for gaining access to the holy guardian angel. Because part of his, his belief system was that one of the basic things you need to do in magic is contact your holy guardian angel, because then you'll be put on the right path. But what he used to contact his holy guardian angel was a ritual which started off as an ancient Egyptian exorcism. Not an invocation, but an exorcism. And it was the, st it was the stele or the stele of Jew. And it's a <coughs> fabulous piece. Uh, there's a paragraph in there at the end, which is really, really gets it going. But it passed through many alterations and things. So first of all, it was published by in the mid 1800s. Then the Golden Dawn adopted it. Um, they, they called it the, the Bornless One. Why? Because the ritual was actually about the Akephalus one. Akephalus god was a god with no head. There's a reason for that, but there's no time to explain. And so they thought, well, if he had no head, he had no beginning, so he'd not been born, so he's bornless. So the Golden Dawn called it the bornless ritual. But nevertheless, they retained the words and then passed it to Crowley. And then Crowley decided that this with additions and subtractions was what he needed to call his holy guardian angel. Now I would not recommend anybody use it to call their holy guardian angel. It does a number of other things very efficiently. Uh, it can invoke the Akephalus god. It can drive spirits out. It's a very good exorcism. But as for uh, achieving contact with the holy guardian angel, Hmm, not so sure. Of course, it's always possible that Crowley's holy guardian angel was the Akephalus god, but um, I, I'm joking. Okay, so... Um, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned about the, um, the voice communication. Yes. And um, no, I'm just interested with like, your, regards to your experience with regards to the invocation and stuff like that. How often do you find spirits would communicate like a verbal? way rather than, say, visual, if you're a, uh, or a crystal. Okay, I got, I got the question. <coughs> They're much better with visual, uh, either using it as a crystal or having them materialize or part materialize outside the circle, not in the circle, but in the triangle. The idea of the triangle is to constrain them. It's one of the five or six levels of uh, Solomonic invocation is to constrain them in the triangle. Um, I have never experienced anything but very short bursts of, of sound communication. And it's, it, it's mostly gabbled, and that may be my fault. But um, I think passing it through a scryer who will interpret it in their own head and then speak, that is fine. And that's why I'm 99% sure that Rose Crowley was scrying and speaking and it wasn't a disembodied voice. Alistair didn't want to give credit to his wife. Very chauvinist of him. So I'm not going to say that Rose was in there. I'm going to say I was in an empty room. If I was Rose, I'd have been completely pissed off because she devised the original ritual. She got in contact with Horus. Then when they went to the Bulak Museum, um, she found his steely which had, uh, as an um, item number, 666 on the top, so Crowley went, wow, this is true. And yes, it, that's a nice confirmation. She got the right steely, she got the right god, but the communication um, was not direct voice. Thanks for Thank being Thank you so much. <laughs>